Uh, good morning. Thanks for attending. Uh, sorry for the delay here, a little technology glitch, but um, we think we've got it working. We should be on the live stream as well. So thanks for those in the room. Thanks for those watching online. Uh, my name is Matt Skinner. I um, serve here at Westminster uh, supporting the adult education ministries, and this is co-sponsored by Adult Education, uh, Family, Youth, and Children, uh, West Connect, maybe even some other groups uh, that I've missed. But uh, we're glad to have you here and really glad to have Austin Hartke uh, back among us for the second of three presentations. The last one will be next week. I'll try to keep this quick because we've used up some time, but he's the author of Transforming the Bible and Lives of Transgender Christians, uh, which I highly recommend to all of you who are looking for uh, some spring or summer reading material. He's also the founder and director of Transmission Ministry Collective, which is an online community dedicated to uh, spiritual care, faith formation, and the leadership potential of transgender and gender expansive Christians. Last thing, he's a graduate of Luther Seminary, a humble little school across the river, which um, I know well. Uh, today's topic is celebrating gender diversity in Scripture. So join me in welcoming Austin. Well, thank you so much, Matt. Thanks, everybody, for inviting me here again. I'm glad I didn't get uh, disinvited after my last session. So we're, things are going well so far. I'm glad to be here. Um, so as Matt said, today we're talking about seeing gender diversity in Scripture. And so before we uh, get into Scripture, I just want to remind us uh, for folks that uh, weren't here last time or, uh, you know, it's been two weeks, you've got stuff going on in your life you might not remember, um, I just want to give you our little rundown of what we're talking about when we talk about gender. So uh, we talk about gender as having three sort of components that all uh, affect each other. We can think of gender as biopsychosocial. So it's got biological, psychological, and sociological elements. So the first element has to do with our bodies, right? So our bodies are internal and external reproductive organs, chromosomes, hormone levels, and brain matter. So that's all the biological element of gender. You've got your gender identity, which is your psychological element, your internal self-perception and experience of being female, male, both, or neither. And then you've got your gender expression. So the way you show your gender to others through clothing, hair, mannerisms, voice, etc., which have gendered values in your specific time and place. Taking on specific gender roles can also be part of our gender expression. So these are sort of the three facets of gender that we talked about last week as a little bit of an introduction to our passages. And uh, I thought it'd be good to just give us a little reminder of these facets. When we're talking about uh, the Bible and gender, we usually can't say things definitively about people's gender identity in Scripture because we can't go back and ask them, right? We can't go back and, and talk to them about how they experience their gender. But we can look at pieces of Scripture related to bodies and related to gender expression, so this, the, the biological and the uh, sociological elements of gender. So today we're going to ask two questions when we're looking at the Bible. We're going to ask, firstly, where in uh, Scripture is gender diversity in bodies and expression seen as a neutral or a positive thing? Last week, or two weeks ago when we met, we talked about how uh, these aspects of gender were sometimes negative or problematic, how that showed up in Scripture, and so we kind of dealt with a lot of those passages last time. So this time we're looking at the uh, positive aspects. And secondly... What experiences do characters in the Bible have that resonate with trans and gender expansive people today? So not just the pieces of scripture that have to do specifically with gender, but pieces that uh, have stories or have aspects that um, trans or gender expansive people today connect with, where they see themselves reflected in scripture and where they see scripture speaking to their lives, even if it's not directly about gender. So those, that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, if you remember when we met two weeks ago, at the we sort of ended our our uh, journey through Scripture and some of the the quote unquote clobber passages by talking about um, uh, eunuchs, and so that's going to come up again today. But before we do that, I want to talk about one example of um, sort of gender diversity within Scripture within uh, the context of Genesis. So you might remember that last time we talked about Genesis 1 and uh, uh, people being created male and female and how we understand Genesis 1. I want to look today at Genesis chapter 2 because, of course, we have a second creation account. And in the second creation account, things happen a little bit differently. 
So in the second creation account, we get uh, this uh, moment of God creating, you know, uh, this beautiful garden, and we are told about the uh, the rivers in the garden and all kinds of beautiful things, rivers and plants. And then we are told, the Lord God said, it is not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The human said, this one finally is bone of my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because from a man she was taken. So in this second version of creation, instead of the two human beings being created at the same time, we have one human being created first and then the second human being, right? And I uh, don't usually use the Common English Bible for quotes, uh, but I like the way that they use the word human being rather than man in this uh, particular passage because um, it's more close to the Hebrew <laughs> in, because in the Hebrew um, uh, of this passage, it's talking about the uh, the uh, Adam, which we kind of think of as Adam. We make it into a proper noun, uh, but it really just means it comes from Adama, from ground, from earth. Um, it just means earth creature. And in the beginning, this earth creature has no gender. There is no gender mentioned. We get um, he, him pronouns used for this earth creature, but that is kind of to be expected in the context that this is written in. Um, but we get this human being that doesn't have a gender at the beginning, and it's not until the second human being is created that you get ish and isha, or man and woman. So that's why it's a little bit of a, a play on words there. She will. Um, that's why um, she is called woman from a man she was taken, because of ish and isha, the Hebrew words. So we get this original human being who doesn't have a gender. Or, and doesn't really have a, um, uh, it's sort of an androgynous being. And one of the reasons that that's interesting for us as we think about the origins of gender, it, because in Genesis 1, we have, you know, that example of gender being like a thing from the very beginning. God creates the male and female. And in Genesis 2, it's more of a later thing. Um, two things that are interesting to note about this. First of all, that um, with, uh, I think a lot of times when we think about what humans should be, we think about how God originally created us. Uh, we kind of use Eden as this model of like what we should be, uh, almost what we should be getting back to in some cases. Um, and so it's interesting to see an example of creation where gender is not an immediate thing that is relevant. It's not until um, there's a problem sort of isolated that we get gender. And the problem is not that the first human being is not gendered. That isn't an issue. It doesn't seem like. The problem is that the first human being is lonely. <laughs> and that's the problem that is being um, sort of fixed by the creation of the second human being. So um, with this example of um, a, a second story of, of Genesis... Uh, a lot of times um, ancient uh, commentators on scripture would kind of think like, okay, how do we make sense of the fact that we have these two different creation stories and that they tell two different stories? How do they make sense together? Um, and so I want to show you an example of one of the ways that um, uh, sort of early, um, well, not early, but uh, depending on your context, but uh, rabbis between 300 and 600 CE talked about this passage. There's a, a book called Genesis Rabbah, which is a commentary on Genesis within the Mishnah, which is sort of a one of the Jewish um, collections of um, wisdom about scripture. And in Genesis Rabbah, one of the things that they do is they look through and they try to make sense of words and things that might seem like they conflict. So the rabbis are asked about Genesis uh, 1 and 2 and how it can make sense that we have both man and woman created together in Genesis 1 and then gender happening differently in Genesis 2. And here's what they come up with. Uh, so here's what the Genesis Rabbah says. In the hour when the Holy One created the first human, he created him as an androgyny. As it is said, male and female, he created them. 
So Rabbi Shmuel ben Na- Bar Nachmani says, In the hour when the Holy One created the first human, he created for him a double face and sawed him and made him backs, a back here and a back there, as it is said, back and before you formed me. So he goes to Psalms and he's like, well, Psalm says back and before you formed me. So we also have to make sense of that. All the other rabbis objected and said, but it says he took one of his ribs. And Rabbi uh, Shmuel says, he said to them, it means one of his sides, just as you would say, the side of the tabernacle. So he brings in Exodus. So uh, they bring in several different pieces of scripture to try to make sense of what words are happening here. But what they come up with is this idea of the first human being as sort of this back-to-back human that is then split. And so if you are familiar with Plato's symposium at all, um, this idea of the first uh, human beings being created sort of like this, and then the gods, Zeus throws down lightning bolts and splits the people, and that's how you find your soulmate, is you find the person that you were originally attached to, right? So Plato's symposium was between three and 600 years before this, and there's a lot of interesting conversation about who influenced who (laughs) in this connection of stories. But what's interesting, the reason I bring this up is because it's an example of um, uh, early, you know, biblical scholars looking at these stories and going, yeah, perhaps one of like the first model for human beings was either sort of a, a combination of genders or a genderless or androgynous being. So, um, not, I, I think we need to not so much think about how we can get back to Eden as we need to think about how we move forward into, um, sort of being new creations as Christians. But I do think it's interesting that one of our early models for gender is a more androgynous model because so often people really um, push the Genesis 1 idea of, well, God created gender like this from the beginning. So it's interesting to think about a different kind of model that might be coming forward. So having said that, talked a little bit about Genesis, let's talk back again about Unix. Um, You'll remember from two weeks ago, we talked about um, Unix in Deuteronomy uh, 23.1, which was a verse that talked about how Unix should not be allowed in the assembly of the Lord. And we talked about what that might mean. Uh, One of the things that it might have meant was that Unix, people who were um, assigned male at birth but then castrated, were not allowed into worship in the temple. That's one of the ways that that verse might have been translated or might have been implemented. So we talked about Deuteronomy 23. We talked about Isaiah chapter 56, which was the story about how God welcomes the eunuchs and the foreigners into God's house. So this idea of like a change in the rules that eunuchs should now be allowed in. But if you remember, I also said that that law or that sort of prophecy never really came to fruition as far as we understand it. So we talked about uh, we talked about um, Isaiah fifty six, and then we talked about Jesus's uh, um, sort of mention of eunuchs in uh, Matthew nineteen. So that was sort of our movement of tracking eunuchs throughout Scripture. As we kind of move through Scripture further than that, we get to the book of Acts, and of course the book of the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter eight. And there's a lot to say about this story. So. I thought we would read through it and just sort of notice some things as we're moving through it. Um, uh, So we're going to kind of read piece by piece, and then I'm going to just sort of point some things out and highlight some things. So we start out with the setting for the story. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to the chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. So um, the first thing that's interesting to point out about this passage is the variety of identities that the Ethiopian eunuch holds, right? Um, I so often, now now that I talk about this passage so often, I wish that this person, that their name was recorded because it always feels weird to constantly be talking about this person and not have a name attached to it. Christian tradition has uh, a couple different names, um, especially in, uh, of course, the Ethiopian uh, church and within the Eastern Orthodox church, there's names. But we don't really know this person's name, so we just call them the Ethiopian eunuch. But that, I think, highlights the fact that this person has so many different identities, right? So this person is a eunuch, so probably somebody who was assigned male at birth and then castrated pre-puberty. 
This person is Ethiopian, so uh, coming from Ethiopia, although not the Ethiopia that we know today. This would have been a little bit further north in what at the time was called Moreau. Um, so this person was of a different race or ethnicity than Philip, who, who um, is the main disciple in this chapter. This person is also the uh, court official of the, the queen of the Ethiopians, right? So this person is in charge of her entire treasury. This person has power, uh, enough power to travel all the way to Jerusalem, enough power and money to have a scroll of Isaiah, which would have been a, a hard thing to come by if you didn't have money. Um, but this person was in the service of the queen, and we're not sure whether that would have been in the context of being a um, uh, a freed person or an enslaved person. We don't know what the context was there. So this person's in kind of an interesting socioeconomic bracket. And of course, this person is uh, on the way or on the way back from going to Jerusalem to worship in the temple, is reading the prophet Isaiah, knows about the um the Hebrew God, although we are not told that this person is Jewish. So this person is in kind of an interesting middle faith space as well, um, where we're not totally sure what was going on in terms of was this person somebody who wanted to convert to uh, uh, the Hebrew, um, sort of the, the Jewish religion as it was sort of forming in that temple period. Was this a person who would have just been considered what we would call a God-fearer, somebody who worshipped the God of Israel but was not Jewish themselves? So we don't know what was going on with this person's faith space either. So this person has all these middle space identities, all these in-between identities, and so it's fitting that this story takes place in the wilderness, the middle space of Israel, right? So the, the setting very much matches this person who Philip is meeting. So... Um, as you note, of course, this person is reading the prophet Isaiah, right? And if you remember what we talked about with Isaiah 56 and this welcome to eunuchs, you might think, was this person reading that bit from Isaiah 56 about how the eunuchs should be welcomed? And that's why they went to the temple to worship. Well, not quite. Just a little bit ahead of there is where the eunuch is reading. So we're going to read what's going on there. So Philip runs up. Here's him reading the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he replied, how can I unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. So this moment where they're reading scripture together is a fascinating one. Um, and uh, this passage that they're reading from Isaiah is what in Christianity we think of as um, the suffering servant song, and we connect it to Jesus, right? It's a story about this person who has been treated terribly, treated unjustly, um, killed despite being sinless, right? And so Christians immediately go, ah, Jesus. Um, the Israelite people uh, would have understood this as uh, within the context of the people of Israel being treated poorly despite not deserving it. So there's different interpretations of the passage here. But of course, Philip, being a Jesus follower, would have connected this with Jesus right away, right? But who is who does the, the eunuch think is sort of speaking here? And that's why they ask the question, who is this about, right? Why does the eunuch ask? Who this is about. Why is this relevant to the eunuch? One of the theories is that the eunuch was seeing themselves in scripture, in this Isaiah passage, in this story about somebody being denied justice, because the eunuch would have just traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship, and because of the laws around who is allowed temple access and the fact that that passage, that beautiful passage from Isaiah welcoming eunuchs was probably never enacted, it's likely that the eunuch would have traveled all the way to Jerusalem and not been allowed to worship in the temple after all. So you can imagine making this huge journey, maybe with this scroll of Isaiah, thinking like, ah, here's my ticket. You get there and you can't worship with the rest of the community. So if this person is on their way back home and that has happened, they are probably feeling rejected. They are probably feeling like justice has been denied to them. They are probably feeling humiliated. These things that are all talked about in this passage. And so it's possible that what's happening here is the eunuch is reading this passage and going, this person understands my experience. This person gets what it's like. Um, 
so there are a lot of other interesting reasons why this eunuch might be connecting with this passage, but um, they end up asking this question, who is this about, right? And Philip, of course, says it's about Jesus. So Philip begins to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch says, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. So, here you have Philip, (laughs) who says this passage is about Jesus, and the eunuch having this sense that finally somebody understands what this experience is like, the eunuch connects with this story of Jesus. So the eunuch says, what is to prevent me from being baptized? And that is the the sort of crux of this whole story, is this question, what is to prevent me from being baptized? We think of it, because we've read this story so often, we think of it as like a rhetorical question almost, because we know what the end of the story is like. But the eunuch would not, this would not have been a rhetorical question for this person. This person would have actually been like wondering, especially in the context of not being able to worship with the Jerusalem community in the way that they thought they would, what is to prevent me? What is to get in the way? And Philip could have given a list of reasons, right? Philip could have appealed to any of those middle space identities that the eunuch has. Philip could have said, well, you're a eunuch. We don't know how we feel about that in early Christianity yet. You are a person of a different ethnicity or race than me, and we haven't baptized any Gentiles yet. Cornelius comes later. Um, uh, could have said, you know, you are not uh, of the same uh, same thing, of the same, same sort of faith background as me. Uh, Philip could have said, you are um, the uh, in this socioeconomic state where you're a servant to the queen of Ethiopia. We haven't quite decided what to do about people that are uh, either enslaved or servants, whether we need to get their sort of um, the uh, person's um, whoever has enslaved them, if, if they're a, an enslaved person, um, whoever has enslaved them to sort of agree to this conversion. So there's so many reasons that Philip could have said, no, you can't be baptized. No, you can't join this community. But Philip doesn't do that. Philip doesn't even say, let me go back and talk with James and uh, and Peter in Jerusalem and like make sure it's okay with them first. <laughs> Let's have a church meeting about it first. Doesn't even say that. Just baptizes him, right? And uh, this uh, sort of, it's interesting to note, if you're reading through this in your Bible, you might notice that there's actually a verse skipped over here. Um, uh, (laughs) After the, look, here is water, what is to prevent me from being baptized, there's a verse that's skipped in your, probably in your Bible, depending on how old your Bible is. There might be another verse there. There was a verse inserted in this story for a long time where um, Peter, or Peter, where Philip says, um, you know, trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and et cetera, and kind of almost makes the unit go through this sort of sinner's prayer moment of like confess and that Jesus is Lord and then you can be baptized. And throughout biblical scholarship, they've kind of figured out, oh, that was a later addition by the church. <laughs> the church was like upset that there were no conditions placed on this person's baptism. So we had to plug in a conditional verse that said, if you do this, then you can be baptized. But that wasn't in the original text. It wasn't in the original story. So now if you go back and look in your Bible, you've probably got a, a skip over in a verse there. I believe it's 37 that got taken out, or maybe it's 36. Um, so go in and check that out because it's interesting to note how the history of Christianity was like, no, no, this is too open. We have to put some conditions on it first. So at the end of this story, the eunuch goes away rejoicing, right? The eunuch does not have to change anything about themselves to be part of this new Christian community. So um, if you're interested in this story of the Ethiopian eunuch, um, there's a really interesting um, book called Queering the Ethiopian Eunuch by Sean Burke. Um, and it's, I think, a great um compilation of a lot of what's going on here. But he says, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is marked as a key moment in the story of the community's mission of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. The baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch begins a process that culminates in the table fellowship between Peter and Cornelius, ultimately between Jewish and Gentile Jesus believers. This process is initiated by the first by first deconstructing the very identity categories that produce binary opposites, such as Jew, Gentile, man, unman, female, male, per- penetrator, penetrated, free slave, and citizen or native and foreigner. <laughs> 
In the discourse of the book of Acts, the fulfillment of the community's divinely mandated and divinely directed mission depends on this deconstruction. So there's a lot going on here, but basically this idea is so much of um, what we, how we understand other human beings is in binary categories of like me or not like me, <laughs> who has power and who doesn't, the haves and the have nots, right? And part of what early Christianity had to do was figure out how to break down those binaries so that they could be in fellowship together. So this is a really powerful story. The Ethiopian eunuch is a powerful story because it tells us what the early church was doing when it came to people outside the bounds of binary gender um, and what kind of welcome should have been sort of given to them and what kind of welcome was given to this person who was an African gender expansive person. This person became part of the foundation of our Christian church, right? So another example Another place where this sort of breaking down of binary shows up is, of course, in Galatians. So moving into what Paul was kind of thinking about um, in the early church. Um, this is a classic verse, right? In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So again, we have these binaries, right? These two opposites that are set up against each other um, and the idea uh, that Paul has is this sort of breaking down of these binaries for you are one in Christ. Um, remembering, you know, it's important to remember that when Paul is addressing the Galatians <laughs> to Galatia, it's like a huge area of the world. <laughs> um, this was not like a specific community. This was kind of, it's almost the like to everyone else letter. <laughs> Um, and so it's really a formation of like how the early church was meant to be. And when we're thinking about this idea of breaking down these binaries, um, one of the sort of ditches that we can accidentally fall into is the belief that what Paul means here is we should just erase all differences and pretend differences don't exist. The sort of like um, colorblindness thing of like, I just don't see difference, right? That maybe that was what Paul was going for here was we should just pretend everybody's the same. Um, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what Paul's actually going for here. Uh, there might be another way that we can understand how to be community and how to break down these binaries without ignoring the fact that there are very real differences in the societies that we live in, right? Um, in transforming in the book I wrote, I, connect this particular passage with the story of um, one of my friends who has sadly passed on now, uh, Lynn Young, who is uh, a Native American or was a Native American person, um, gender expansive person. And Lynn talks about the experience of um, uh, how this verse was used um, and, and in sort of Native communities in Christian Native communities, this verse was used to kind of say, you shouldn't be Native anymore, you should just be a Christian, by which they meant you should just be a white Christian. <laughs> and this idea of like the erasure of people's identities in order to be sort of homogenized into Christianity. And so that's sort of one ditch that we have definitely fallen into as Christians throughout history. But there's another way of understanding this passage that I think is a lot more freeing. So... Um, this is from an article called Gender Trouble in Galatia by Brigitte Call. She says, this is a little academic, so stick with me. The question at stake here is how Paul defines unity. The question can be put in a very simple way. If two are unified into one, what does that really mean? There are two possibilities. First, A plus B becoming C, that is, finding a new way of coexistence, mutuality, and community that both changes and preserves the old identities and distinctions. Secondly, a more hierarchical unity mode, A plus B united into A. That is, one just swallows up the other one, making differences disappear. Paul's basic concern is the messianic transformation of Jewish identity toward an inclusiveness that can integrate difference without ceasing to be Jewish. His insistence that the Galatian non-Christian Jews remain as they are, that is, uncircumcised, shows that oneness of God and of Israel no longer marked, is no longer marked by sameness and superiority. So the idea here is there's two ways you can be united. You can be united by all being the same, or you can be united 
by integrating your differences and making a whole that is comprised of different parts. So to give an image of this, I give the image of the difference between a wall that is painted all one color and a stained glass window. They both create a hole. They both create a hole that is either a whole wall painted the same other color, or you have a stained glass window that produ produces one larger picture. But the stained glass window is one larger picture comprised of lots of different pieces of glass that are all different shapes and sizes and colors, right? But you're still a whole. And that's kind of the, the, the two possibilities here, right? We can be sort of whitewashed all the same, or we can be who we are, different, and yet still creating one whole picture. Um, so I, I kind of love the way this idea that, like, this could be the kind of community that we're called to, to be a, a stained glass window sort of community rather than an all one color community. So that's where I'm going to end on the sort of passages specific to gender, because there are a lot of passages uh, and a lot of stories in the Bible that really connect with trans folks today that don't necessarily have to do specifically with gender, but you'll kind of see how gender is sort of uh, woven through these stories. So the first one is God's call to Abraham. So uh, Genesis 32, right? The Lord says to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So this story about the call of Abraham, how can this be connected? Like what, why would trans folks connect to this story? Well, the interesting thing about Abram in this story, um, other than God just sort of like showing up out of nowhere to this random guy, which is an interesting thing to think about when you kind of get into it. Um, Abram has a very specific identity that he is expected to live into. As the oldest member, uh, the oldest son in his family, he would have been um, expected to take care of his father and to sort of like carry on the family legacy in a very specific way. Um, and uh, some scholars kind of talk about how the identity of the oldest son is almost a specific kind of gender identity in a way that being a younger son is not. Different expectations are held of you by being the oldest son. And so Abram has all these expectations and responsibilities as the oldest son in his family. And at this time, Abram's father is still alive. Abram's father lives to be, I'm trying to remember, we're told it's like 130 or something like that. Um, so Abram is uh, 75 when he departs from Haran, as we're told here, but his father is still alive. So Abram is in many ways um, uh, taking, <laughs> he's, it says he like takes a whole bunch of his family's wealth with him when he goes. He's leaving his father uh, in a way that is directly in conflict with what he was supposed to do as the oldest son. So hold on to that for a second as we think about one other piece of this passage. That ver that one word, go, <laughs> is doing a lot of work in English. <laughs> the first thing that God says to Abram, go. Um, in English, we just translate it as go. In Hebrew, it's lech lecha, which technically, literally means go to or for yourself. It's a reflexive thing. Uh, go to yourself or go for yourself. Uh, not just go, necessarily. <laughs> um, and so lech lecha has become a really, really important um, moment of Jewish scholarship. What does it mean that God says go to or go for yourself? What does that mean? So holding on to that idea of God saying go to or for yourself and this idea of God promising all these things, I will bless you, and then you will be a blessing. God doesn't say anything about what Abram's going to do for God. Weird and interesting. So hold on to that, and then hold on to this idea that Abram is sort of leaving his role as the oldest son. And this is what, uh, this is the connection. This is from Joy Layden, who's a, um, a Jewish trans woman and a scholar and a poet. She says, before God speaks to him, Abraham has faithfully fulfilled his firstborn role by following his father Terah from their native city, Ur of the Chaldeans, to the city of Haran. 
But when God tells him to go forth from the elderly Terah's house, Abraham does not hesitate to betray his father and violate the gender role he was born into. Abraham's trans experience, the experience of rejecting his assigned gender role, is presented by the Torah as both a, a fulfillment of God's will and as required in order to receive God's blessing. In Hebrew, God's first words to Abraham are lech lecha, literally go to or for yourself. These words frame Abraham leaving his father's house not as a spiritual quest, God doesn't say lech li, go to or for me, but as a self-centered act of becoming. So this is an interesting way of thinking about Abram's story. And, and Joy goes on to talk about like this idea of, uh, of becoming as self-centered versus for the community. Because what Abraham is called to do, to go to or for himself, then becomes a blessing for the entire rest of the world. God says this blessing starts with you and then it goes on. You are blessed to be a blessing. And so Joy goes on to talk about the ways that trans folks, as we live into ourselves, as we go to and for ourselves in our calling to be who God created us to be, we then become blessings to other people as well. So there's like a connection here between the going and becoming, the being yourself, and this idea of leaving who people expected you to be in order to do that, even when it's really difficult. <laughs> Um, and so this is a story that trans folks have connected with, both Jewish and Christian trans folks have connected with quite a bit. Another story here uh, comes from Job. And Job, we all know because he had a lot of terrible things happen to him, right? Uh, terrible things happened to Job. He lost his family. He lost his health. He lost everything in life, basically. Um, and Job's friends kind of try to make sense of why this happens. So one of Job's friends is Zophar the Nathamite. So Zophar comes to Job and he says, If you direct your heart rightly, you will stretch out your hands toward God. If your iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and do not let wickedness reside in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish, you will be secure, and that you will not fear. Job answered, my face is red with weeping, and deep darkness is on my eyelids, though there is no violence in my hands, and my prayer is pure. O earth, do not cover my blood. Let my outcry find no resting place. Even now, in fact, my witness is in heaven, and he that vouches for me is on high. So this story of Job is a, a story about a lot of things, but it's a story about a person who has terrible things happen to them, and one of the responses from the community is, well, Job, you must have done something to deserve this. You must have sinned in some way for God to be treating you like this, right? And that's what Zophar is saying. If you've sinned, just repent, and this will get better. And Job says, I haven't done anything. <laughs> and God knows I haven't done anything. I didn't do anything to deserve this. So this story of suffering and people kind of putting that blame back on the person who is suffering is something that a lot of trans folks experience when we um, are dealing with, uh, we're going to talk about this next week as we talk about trans allyship, when we deal with transphobia in the world, when we deal with people treating us poorly, um, transphobia and experiences of discrimination cause negative mental health outcomes. <laughs> so there's like a huge rate of uh, of uh, depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation within the trans community because of the experiences of oppression that we face. But sometimes people look at the community and they go, well, if you didn't, you know, if you just weren't trans, if you would just repent from being who you are, then you wouldn't have these terrible things. You wouldn't have these terrible mental health outcomes. Um, if you would just... Um, live into the gender roles you're supposed to live into, you wouldn't have to worry about getting beat up in the bathroom every time you go to the bathroom, right? Like this experience of being blamed for your own suffering is something that trans folks experience quite a lot. So this is from Trans Faith, uh, which is written by Chris Dowd and Christina Beardsley, both trans folks in the UK. They say, we would argue that the analogy between Job and trans people works on another deeper level. It arises from the narrative of a person persecuted, blamed, and excluded in order to allow people to remain in their theological comfort zones. The analogy goes even deeper as the story unfolds to reveal a figure who experiences extreme loss, social isolation, slander, despair, and yet retains a faith in themselves and in within God. So this image of a person who 
um, is sort of like blamed for what's going on so that other people can believe that, you know, the world is a is a good place where only bad people get bad things. <laughs> it's lazy theology and it causes suffering, right? And so this idea of trans people connecting with the story this way, but also connecting with a person who suffers and yet does not give up and does not lose a relationship with God, a person who can question God, who can yell at God and be like, God, why are you doing this? <laughs> and yet being in relationship with God throughout, right? And that's something that I think um, lots of trans Christians, lots of trans people of faith in general, um, feel a connection to this idea that like, um, that there is somebody who has suffered and yet has not given up that relationship with God. So I think I've got one more story here um, and then just a couple of notes and then we will have time for questions. So um, this last story is the story of Jesus's resurrection uh, appearance to the disciples and to Thomas, right? We just talked about if, um, I don't know if y'all do the lectionary here very, do you do the lectionary? No. So this comes up in lectionary uh, recently in other faith communities, but um, this is a story that we often tell at Easter anyways. Um, so uh, if you remember, the disciples are all gathered in a house and Jesus shows up to them and the disciples are amazed and the only one that's not there is Thomas. And so Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it, right? I won't believe it till I feel and touch and see Jesus. So then we get this passage. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So this story is one about, again, about a lot of things, but about um, uh, Jesus showing up with a body that is changed post-resurrection. Um, it's interesting to think about the fact that Jesus could have been risen, could have risen from the dead, um, with a perfectly like clean, shiny new body, right? With no scars, with no wounds. <laughs> Jesus could have just been like, whoop, here I am, surprise, I'm fine. Uh, but instead, Jesus keeps the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side post-resurrection. Why? <laughs> well, because Jesus's wounds tell his story. Jesus's wounds show who he is. And like we've known this through thousands of years of Christian history where like the stigmata is a big thing. It shows who Jesus is and it connects people to Jesus, right? So uh, we've got this person who is um, risen and has a changed body. That's a interesting and important concept to some trans folks who worry a lot about this idea of like, what will you look like in heaven? <laughs> what will you look like in heaven? Will you still have the body that you have now, will your body be different? What will it look like? Um, for some trans folks who grew up with a very robust theology of heaven and like what that's like, that can be a really worrying thing. Like, what if I get to heaven and I look like I did before I transitioned? Or what if I get to heaven and I don't look like me anymore? Um, and this idea of Jesus resurrecting with changes is something that can be really powerful for them. Like, no, your body retains the things about you that tell your story. Um, and so for some trans folks, that's really powerful. The other thing that's happening here is Jesus' relationship with Thomas, right? Jesus says, sure, Thomas, you can like touch my hands in my side, right? Uh, you need that in order to believe. And lots of trans folks experience a lot of curiosity about our bodies. <laughs> a lot of like, what's in your pants? What kind of surgeries have you had? A lot of like curiosity and even like bordering on voyeurism around like what our bodies are like. And um, for a lot of us, we have to kind of figure out how to juggle, like, wanting to um, be in relationship with people and share our stories and also just, like, have privacy as a human being <laughs> and have privacy about our bodies and not feel like we need to share that with every single person we come across. And so this interaction that Jesus has with Thomas is fascinating because Jesus seems to be saying, here, Thomas, because of this relationship that you and I have, I will do this for you, but I'm not going to do this for every Joe on the street. <laughs> Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe, right? 
And of course, that was a helpful thing for much of the Christian community who would not ever meet Jesus. But like the idea of Jesus saying, there are things that you are not going to be able to see and they are still true. Not everything that is true is something that you can see and verify like in the way that you want to. (laughs) And I think that's something that can be a good word to Christians who are like, well, how can we believe that trans people really are who they say they are? How do we believe somebody's gender identity if we can't see it, if we can't prove it? And it's like, well, we're people of faith. We believe all kinds of stuff we can't see and prove all the time. It doesn't mean that they're not true, right? So Jesus' relationship with Thomas is um, an interesting one here as well. Uh, I'm just going to show you an um, image here. If you are familiar at all with like religious art, um, you may know uh, this uh, painting of Jesus and Thomas. But it was recently, fairly recently, last few years, um, recreated by a woman named Elizabeth Olsen Wallen who did photographs um, of like biblical stories and famous paintings um, with trans folks to try to like put people in the story. So you've got um, uh, Caravaggio's uh, Incredulity of Thomas here and then part of the ID trans exhibit by Elizabeth Olsen Wallen recreating this same sort of photo to give you this connection of this story here. So you have uh, this person um, on the right, this sort of transmasculine person who has had chest reconstruction surgery. And it's this sort of comparison of bodies and what that's like. Um, So I just really love this idea of like telling biblical stories through art. Like in one image, you can get what I just said all about that story pretty much. And I love that you can kind of look at that and see the connections there. So those are some stories that are resonating with trans folks today and how they connect. Um, I am not going to, I had like a little bonus thing here that I'm not going to go through, but I just thought I'd show a quick image of. Um, There are gender expansive people throughout Christian history. Like it's not just like, here's the Bible and then there's today. Like we have thousands of years of gender expansive people, um, including um, uh, Marius the monk, including Madre Juana de la Cruz of Spain, um, maybe including Joan of Arc. That's one people like to argue about what was going on with Joan of Arc. But there are gender expansive people that lived lives um, outside of their assigned birth uh, sex and people whose bodies were different when it came to gender um, that have existed all throughout our Christian history. uh, And we have a long lineage of folks to draw from. So that's where I will leave that. And I wonder what kind of questions you have. So the live stream will cut off in about three minutes, but I don't have any questions from them, which means we get to ask them all. So any questions or comments for Austin? I know he's really hard to offend, so it's true. Anything you want to ask? No, you're totally down with everything I just said. That's so great. (laughs) (laughs) Is that right? Yeah, it helps the live stream people here. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Quinn. Hi, Quinn. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, Actually, I have a question based on the last thing you just said, Mm. because we have so much documented history, right? And I just kind of see like a parallel of what is chosen to be, like whose story is chosen to be told um, in our politics Mm -hmm. today and in our uh, social justice endeavors. And I guess... I'm just really intrigued by that because um, I I personally am not like very religious, but I find that really interesting just because it's so uh, present, I think, in this story and in things going on today. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, the majority is the majority story is here and highlighted, but then the minority is still kind of over here mm-hmm. so it's kind of just like a comment but i appreciated that yeah for sure okay yeah i agree i think you know one of the one of the things that we can do to bring forward some of these stories because some people sometimes people will ask me like have i not heard of these interpretations because they're new or because they've been suppressed or because like why 
Um, and it's sort of like, yes, to all of the above. <laughs> some are new, some are old and have been specifically downgraded in importance. Um, people have been reading stories like um, Joseph, who we talked about two weeks ago, and the Ethiopian eunuch as like examples of queer folks and trans folks, how we would think of it now, in scripture for hundreds and thousands of years. <laughs> They're not new, um, but we have specifically kind of downgraded them or suppressed them because it's not been convenient for the major narrative, right? And it's not been convenient for um, communities that aren't sure how to deal with